Yeah, I, I think, you know, pro ride is stretching us a bit, you know, I'd like to think so, but in reality, you know, the, I, I spent three years, I left uh, a small village in Wales where I grew up, I went to live in France, fully expecting to go and win a Tour de France, obviously, but then I didn't realise how naive I was coming from North Wales until I got, got to France, and then I spent three years there, had a fantastic time, but pre pretty quickly figured out that I was not going to get anywhere near winning the Tour de France, and so... Um, you know, whilst I was there, I, I, I didn't have a great time in school. Um, but what I did discover whilst I was living in France, that I, I really, really liked um, reading about sports science, relating training techniques, nutrition, and, and that whole world of sports science was kind of just taking off, really. You know, the first courses in university were starting to appear, etc. And I just got a real passion for that. So the thing I think I took from it was the you know, I found a new passion within the sport where I thought actually I could pursue this rather than an actual, the athletic side myself, you know, and um, and so that's what I did. I went back to, uh, you know, I left France, went back to university, uh, studied sports science and psychology, sports psychology, and then I went on from there and, and, and later on studied for an MBA, uh, at Sheffield Business School, and combined kind of those two into a role in cycling basically so you know, that's my little story really I think and certainly in British cycling the the like many of the summer Olympic sports the key moment really was the the introduction of the lottery funding program in Great Britain it was a fantastic move and of course what it did for a lot of the governing bodies of those Summer Olympic sports, which are amateur governing bodies, they were very poorly funded. You know, they couldn't really support the national teams that they were responsible for running. Certainly couldn't coach them professionally. Um, and of course, overnight, it just changed that scenario. So all of a sudden, there was an opportunity to get full-time athletes, full-time coaches, all the ologists and sports scientists, scientists behind them to, you know, to, to support that kind of performance environment. And I think that really was a, the catalyst. And, and Peter Keane, who I worked with, who was the first performance director of British Cycling, who wrote the sort of the first vision, as it were, a brilliant, brilliant piece of work. Really, really bright guy, very, very visionary thinker. And um, I met Pete, and they got in touch with me initially back in 1997 to see if I can help out from a commercial point of view. And, and, and we, we kind of got on pretty well, really well. And, you know, I, I realised there and then that, hold on a minute, this is game changing and, and this is where I want to be. And the opportunity that, that the whole lottery structure presented, British cycling in the Olympic arena was just huge. You know, you could see it massively exciting time, sort of game changing time. And, um, you know, I, I progressed and I, I, I started off as a consultant and then I went full time. Um, and then Pete moved on and, and, and I took over the, uh, the performance director's role and, you know, just just embraced it really and loved every, every single minute of it. It was just, we had a fantastic group of riders. We had, a, you know, a, a great bunch of staff, very, very driven. And I think it was just like that voyage of discovery, you know, all of a sudden, <coughs> you know, British Cycling hadn't won, well, won one gold medal in 76 years of trying before the year 2000, and that was Chris Boardman. Um, so we tried a lot, but hadn't had that much success. And then all of a sudden, you know, there was this uh, dynamic kind of environment where we started to win more and more Olympic medals. And it was, uh, it was a fantastic journey to be on. It was, it was interesting actually, because I think the uh, UK sports, who's, uh, the government, the UK sports done a terrific job of, of distributing uh, lottery funding and and the one key key aspect really was that it's like a merit, meritocratic system so you know the, the funding there the, the, the key marker is Olympic the position in the Olympic table overall for the nation therefore medals so you know they would basically fund people who could secure the most likely to secure medals and so from our point of view we work very very closely with UK sports and and they had a, a structure at one point where um, they had basically, they looked at your performances in World Championships, Olympic Games, and there's a little equation, and 
they'd figure out how many athletes you should have on your program and then each athlete had a multiplier of financial x amount um, and you added all that up basically and he gave you a total pot and um, we looked at us after Athens with UK Sports and we kind of went back and we, we, got, we had 42 athlete places given to us but when you looked at it there was no way we, we didn't have 42 athletes who could get on an Olympic podium but we looked at it close and we figured we had 24 and so what we did we went back to UK Sports and said actually you know what we've got 24 people we can really genuinely think we can get on an Olympic podium here can we have the same amount of funding for the 42 but put it into the people who can win something and, and go from there and they were brave enough to turn around and say yes you can and um, and I think that type of thinking has led ourselves and other programs to you know to be able to deliver <clears throat> yeah I think that the whole you know you look back and think wow we were pretty naive when we started out really but but we were ambitious and we 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 worked um, with a great bunch of people at British Cycling, from a um, you know from from a sports science perspective, but also uh, from a, a, a psychology perspective and, and the human sort of mind perspective, and and we developed quite a um, an environment really and, and an understanding of what we believed was a, a good way to to try and get the best out of out of athletes, and we felt that that was transferable. Um, and whilst it, you know, we didn't want to step out to another sport totally, actually professional cycling was a, an area of the sport still in cycling where we felt we could step into. And, and one of the real driving factors at the time was that we, we have obviously programmes that start in Great Britain which um, cater for 14 year olds. So you can progress up through the British system, 14, and then you go into the juniors and then you go to the academy system. And then you go out into various professional cycling teams. And it seemed to us that when, once the moment came where it was enough riders, a critical mass of riders, British riders who were good enough to perform at the highest level, once we had that, then that was the time to put a professional team on top. So that actually you could, you could you go all the way up this pathway and then ultimately go into a, a, a British professional cycling team, which was run on the same philosophy and the same principles as, this, as, as their entire kind of time in the sports, which just seemed to make sense to us. We also felt that it was um, we could create a, a safe environment uh, for the British riders to develop into. We recognised it would have to have an international um, cohort of of, uh, of riders to, to get the, the calibre, if you like, of the team to where it needs to be. Um, and of course, we had this fantastic goal when we started out of wanting to try and get the first British rider to um, to win the Tour de France. So all in all, it was um, it was a very exciting project, but. Absolutely, we recognised that there were certain areas that we weren't familiar with, we, and, and it was it was quite challenging to start with, to say the least.